Um, so I wrote Ethers.js. Um, the idea is it's a complete, simple, tiny library. It's a replacement for Web3 and Ethereum.js. Um, if you use either of those, you can use this instead. Um, so some quick history. I was writing an in-browser equivalent of MetaMask, but this was before MetaMask existed. I wanted some like in-browser, DAP browser. Um, so by the time I included all the libraries that I needed, the, this page was 7.4 megabytes to download. Um, There's a lot of bugs back then. I think somebody was mentioning in the other talk earlier that one out of 128 addresses were computed wrong from the private key, so it just produced unspendable um, monies. Uh, the other big thing, especially back in the day, if you wanted to build a dApp, uh, I mean, it was really simple. So all you had to do is um, download Geth, um, wait three days for it to sync, and once that was done, uh, connect to it and do all this other stuff, and now it'll probably work. You might have to blow the database away a few times and like resync from scratch, but it's easy, no worries. Um, so I was basically trying to get around that. The other big issue is all the libraries, Web3, et cetera, were LGPL, GPL, like random weird licenses that were really not conducive to proprietary software, which means that if we have things that eventually occurred like Hyperledger that start making their own sort of versions of it, which would be weirdly incompatible, just because we didn't let them join in the first place. Um, so that was the idea, is basically that sort of idea. Um, also, documentation was like nil. Um, so the highlights of Ethers.js, uh, so it's tiny. Um, over the wire, it's, about, it's actually about 89 kilobytes right now, not 88. Um, but it handles mnemonic, mnemonic keys, uh, private keys, JSON wallets. Um, it tries to really do anything you could do if you were trying to build a wallet or a framework or um, Basically, anything you want to do in Ethereum, it supports. Uh, it's ready to use. One thing that the other options didn't offer, especially at the time, was like a dist package that you could just like jam in a browser and be off to the races. You had to browserify all these libraries to make things work. Um, test cases, most of the libraries around the time, again, even today, have between like 83 and a couple hundred test cases. Um, I'm currently clocked in at 20,000, give or take uh, maybe 50 or 60 test cases. Um, a lot of them are procedurally, procedurally generated. Love to talk about that for anybody afterwards who wants to find out more about how to like procedurally generate test cases. Um, providers, uh, going back to the syncing a full node, providers, you should be able to use anything you want. So you can use JSON RPC, but there's things like Etherscan and technically my crypto, you could just like kind of tie into their, their back end. There's no reason why you can't just use these other sources of truth. Um, so another big difference from people coming from Web3 is that signers and providers, actually I'll go more into this in the next slides, but as a quick overview, signers and providers are very different, um, but there's different types of signers. Um, ENS support is a first class citizen. Again, I'll go more into that in a few slides. Um, ABIV2, this, ABIV2 has been available in Ethers.js for over a year now. Um, I was kind of talking it up last year at the previous DevCon. Again, lost documentation and everything. All dependencies are MIT licensed which meant a few of the libraries that existed, like RLP encoding at the time, again, were only available as GPL or LGPL. So like those things were rewritten so that they could be MIT licensed. Um, how many, okay, I uh, can't read the clock. Um, anyways, so yeah, going back to providers, so there's lots of different types of providers, um, Etherscan, Infira, JSON RPC, IPC, web is coming soon. There's a web three provider, which you can, if you have a currently, current existing web three app, you just jam that provider wrap it in a Web3 provider, and now you have an Ethers compatible provider you can use for uh, any of these sorts of things. Fallback provider, we're coming with a smart provider soon, which will, for example, get quorum against multiple backends. Because uh, right now you're trusting APIs, you're trusting Etherscan tells you the truth. What if they're hacked, or you click that I accept turning off SSL protection, basically, when you're at Starbucks. Um, so that's the idea of providers. Providers are very high level, very, only talking to what you'd expect a blockchain to be able to tell you, um, which is very separate from signers. Signers are where your private key lives. The idea that your private key should live in the same memory space as the thing that's just talking to the network and doing crazy things just seems inherently unsafe. Um, so we let wallets be a private key, a mnemonic. Um, for example, Firefly, the hardware wallet we design, or Ledger Nano wallet. These are just other types of signers you want to be able to use to, to carry on and, and do your uh, work. Um, this was a th weird decision. I'm actually curious why this was originally designed. Um, basically, when you send a transaction in Web3, you get back a transaction hash. Um, so, for example, if you send a transaction to the Geth node uh, and you say value this, data that, the Geth node is figuring out the gas price for you, the nonce, all that extra stuff, but all you get back is this opaque hash. So, you actually don't know what it chose for you, um, especially in the case of like gas congestion. 
you actually don't know what was used, so you can't even know if you need to replay the transaction at higher gas cost. Importantly, all that information was signed by the geth node, so it knew all that information. It simply just hashed it and threw all that stuff away and gave you back the hash. Um, so I think it makes a lot more sense to return the hash. This gives you a lot of advantages. Um, the biggest one being that if you deploy a contract, you can instantly know what the, thank you, uh, you can instantly know what the, the contract address is going to be once it's mined. Um, right, that's kind of what this slide explains. Uh, I'm getting ahead of myself, but yes. The last thing I said applied to this slide. D, 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 D. Um, this for me, um, I often go on record saying like, if ENS is the only thing that comes out of Ethereum, then Ethereum has been a wild success. Like ENS, I, people, again, talk to me afterwards, like I, I will talk for hours about how ENS is like the biggest game changer in the crypto space. Like I don't even care about, yeah, yeah, exactly. Maco yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, ENS, go get your stickers later, everyone. Uh, the, uh, so, <laughs> so ENS is really cool because you get these named things. It's kind of like dynamic linking. It means that if your app depends on a contract, you can actually, and you can choose static if you want to put an address in there or dynamic if you want to use an ENS name. But it means if you update your contract, all those places you've deployed code, including maybe ENS, where there's a hash and you can't ever actually change it, um, just continue to work. Your upgraded uh, contract goes off to the races, it's happy and functioning. Um, so you can use it anywhere. Uh, if you're sending a transaction, if you have a ERC-20 token contract and you've got a two address in amount, that two address can just be rickmood.firefly.eth and it will be parsed for you and figured out at deploy time Calling a contract is already asynchronous. There's no additional cost. Um, ah, yes, human readable APIs. Um, okay, I'm at three, I guess. Um, so I always thought this was also a strange idea. We have this, this machine readable code in the form of Solidity. Uh, so we have all these signatures that are machine readable and actually sort of human readable. And so we take that, that machine and human readable code and we turn it into this like machine readable code. Um, it's complicated, so this is a simple ABI. It's six kilobytes worth of JSON, which is kind of ludicrous, as opposed to, uh, like, it's human readable and machine readable, just use the Solidity contract. So if you look, I can't point the thing, eee, but this is like all you need. You just need the signatures. We can parse that for you and figure out what the ABI should be. And the nice thing is if you look at the source code, thank you, thank you, uh, you understand, uh, what this contract is doing. Most of the time you pull a big opaque piece of JSON in, and now the rest of the code, you totally don't really know what's going on, whereas this is very obvious what the ABIs are available to you uh, if you just use them. Um, makes code readable. Um, I think readability is very important, especially in terms of audits and like just trust. So, ah, sorry. I think I'm almost through my slides, uh, sort of. But uh, ABI v2, so like I said, we've supported uh, ABI v2 for over a year now. That's basically you can pass structs in, uh, arrays of strings. It's actually kind of cool. Web3 now supports it. If you take a look at Web3's implementation, uh, it's require ethers slash utils slash ABI coder. Um, it's an awesome solution, and it means we have like one good working solution that everyone can use, and we're off to the races. Uh, da -da 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 -da. Extras, promise friendly, you can basically pass promises in anywhere you can pass a thing in. A lot of blockchain things are asynchronous. So for example, if you have a transaction, uh, one of the things you pass in is a nonce. Well, you can just pass in a, a promise that resolves to the nonce as your nonce. And again, everything's asynchronous, it can be resolved. A BIP39 mnemonics, we support English, Spanish, French, Italian, Japanese, Korean, and both simplified and, and traditional Chinese, um, yes. Utilities, we've got lots of utilities for dealing with, oh, one minute, okay. Uh, ABI code, yeah, so basically stuff. These slides will all be available online. Um, I try to make everything as possibly available as I can, and the rest are just examples. I was not really planning to show these off. These are just in the slide deck, so when you look at the slides afterwards, you can kind of get an example of, it's easy to use, you just pick it up and start using it. There's no syncing nodes, there's none of, uh, you don't need uh, MetaMask or anything, it just works out of the box, and done. So questions? I think I have a minute maybe, half a minute.